want to start out by kind of telling you a little bit of something that may, some of you may not know about me. Uh, when I was a kid growing up, I had an incredible fascination and love for like the world of illusions and street magic and that kind of stuff. Not like dark magic, okay? So don't freak out or anything like that. But And uh, my wife can embarrassingly attest to this as well. You know, you guys remember back before... Um, we streamed everything before Netflix, before YouTube, even back before DVDs. We had these like plastic cartridges, these analog cartridges that had electromagnetic tape on the inside of them. They're called VHS. You guys remember that? Yes. Well, one day my wife goes out to the mailbox and she finds this package. And inside this package, it's addressed to me, but she opens it up and she finds this like the set of three VHS tapes that are like, uh, just a set of this guy, the street magician, teaching illusions and stuff. And she brought it to me, and she's like, what is this about? Where'd this come from? And I was like, well, I bought it after seeing it advertised on a late-night infomercial. <laughs> <clears throat> so um, I say all that. At what, you know, she thought it was the dumbest thing, okay? And you guys are laughing, too. Until I learned all the illusions and started traveling the world making millions. <laughs> But I say all that because I want to show you this magic glove that I brought with me today. You're like, what in the world? You're like, if you're a guest here today, you're like, we came here, they're talking about the Holy Spirit, and the pastor's talking about magic? What? This is not orthodox. Let's leave, honey. No, just hang on with me. This is a magic glove. I've seen it do some, some amazing things before, astounding things, and I wanted to see if we can get it to do some tricks today, if that's okay with you guys, right? I, all right, thank you, Jeff. <laughs> We're magic nerds together, buddy. Let's see if we can get this, this glove here to, to pick up my Bible, okay? So I'm going to just lay the glove over the Bible, and then it's going to do its thing. I've seen, because I've seen this glove do some things, cool things like this before, so. You can do it! <laughs> pick up the Bible. Mm, it's not working. I know, it's probably because it's too heavy. We'll, we'll try the coffee mug. Ready? Pick up the mug. Still nothing. I'm sorry, guys. This is, I'm a little embarrassed by this. I have seen the glove do things before, pick things up. Let's try my phone. Pick up the phone. No, it should have done it by now. I'm sorry, this is really embarrassing. I should have spent more time watching those tapes. Um, <laughs> is anybody here smarter than me? Tell me how I can get this glove to pick these things up? Stick your hand in it. Stick my hand in it. Okay. If you say so, I'll, I'll try. I'll try it that way. I'll stick my hand in it. See if this will do it. Ready? Pick up the Bible. Ta da! Pick up the mug. Ta da! It did it! Isn't it amazing? Pick up the phone. Ta da! Was it on pitch? No. We all know, listen, we all know that this glove is absolutely powerless. It has no power to do anything whatsoever without the hand inside, right? Without the hand inside it, it can do nothing of significance. And the exact same thing is with your life and my life. We have absolutely no power to do anything of kingdom significance without the power of the Holy Spirit working in us and through us. Amen? We've got to have the Holy Spirit in us and through us. And too many believers are out there, too many believers are trying to overcome sin without the power of Holy Spirit. Too many believers are out there and they're trying to, to navigate life without the peace of Holy Spirit. Too many believers are trying to fulfill their purpose without the guidance of Holy Spirit. Why is that? Why, why, why are we out there trying and trying and trying? And maybe it's because we look at the Holy Spirit more as a resource rather than the person of God living on the inside of us. Maybe it's because we think that Holy Spirit is just like another doctrinal point on the checklist instead of actually like cultivating relationship with him. Maybe it's because we don't think Holy Spirit really cares much about being mentioned or thought about on any other day except Sundays. But instead, we really need to think about and give our attention to 
and engage with Holy Spirit in our everyday lives. Amen? I know you guys are really disappointed I didn't do some kind of real magic trick, you know? You're like, man, it would have been really cool if like he like blew in the glove and like, you know, pulled out some kind of handkerchief or something, you know? I don't know. It, it, sorry, there it is, there. Anyway. Lame. I told you guys I made millions doing this. Anyway, we, we started this... <laughs> We started, this, uh, we started this series on the Holy Spirit a few weeks ago. This is part three. Today, we're going to be doing some like, some, some, this is like teaching today. This is not, you know, very much, there's not much preaching in this today, but this is teaching. Because we're going to be talking about some, just found, some foundational truths that every single believer needs to know about the Holy Spirit. And, and, and there's no way to cover all the truths about the Holy Spirit that we need to know in one message. So we're going to just look at a few of them today. And even then, the ones that we're looking at today, we're still going to just be scratching the surface. We'll be giving a lot of scripture today. Uh, if you're taking notes, you'll want to write that down or, or put it in your phone or whatever, because we're not going to have all the scriptures up here on the screen. We're going to have the points up here. But if you're taking notes, you know, just be ready to write down a lot of references, because we'll give those to you. Uh, but... But just keep in mind this, um, the big picture here today is that you're here because you want to know Holy Spirit better than you know Him now. Yeah. You're here today because you want to fulfill your purpose and operate by the power of the Holy Spirit in you more than you are already. And, and so uh, you need to know this, that all the truths that we're going to be talking about, about Holy Spirit, they're summarizations of what the Bible says generally about Holy Spirit, but also what Jesus says particularly. And, uh, and, and I want to encourage you also in this. Even though you, some of you are seasoned believers, you've, you have a lot of teaching already. You have a lot of experience with Holy Spirit. And so some of this, none of this to you, for some of you, may be brand new information. But I want to encourage you to sit here and engage and open your ears and open your heart to what he might, might want to show to you. Because if you do that, I promise, if you come with open heart and open ears, I promise God can still drop some revelation on you, and it's going to be good for you. He's going to bless you. Amen? Yeah. All right. So, so the very first thing, the very first foundational truth about, that we need to know about Holy Spirit is that Holy Spirit is God. Holy Spirit is God. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 17 says, For the Lord is the Spirit. Now, we often talk about the deity of Jesus, but that He is God, because He is. And we don't often talk about the deity, deity of the Father, because I, we all kind of get that, you know? It, it's almost like it's redundant. But just as we recognize the deity of the Father, just as we recognize the deity of Jesus, it's right for us to recognize the deity of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is God, everybody every bit as much as Jesus is God, every bit as much as the Father is God. Now, I realize that some believers, when they think of Holy Spirit and engaging with Holy Spirit, some believers are, you know, a little, um, they're more comfortable with singing songs about glorifying the Father. They're more comfortable about singing songs that glorify the Son. But there's like this weird roadblock for some reason, when it, when it comes to Holy Spirit, they're a little uncomfortable. It's almost as if, like, you know, the Holy Spirit doesn't want to be glorified. He doesn't want to be worshipped or something. Or uh, maybe, like, you know, the Father or the Son are not okay with us glorifying the Holy Spirit. Like, they would be upset. But the truth is that you can worship the Holy Spirit. You can pray to Holy Spirit. You can sing to Holy Spirit. And, and I realize that some of these sincere Christians that have this roadblock... It probably comes from a teaching that, that maybe is even rooted in this verse in John chapter 16, verse 13, in the King James Version. You know, King James Version, that's the, the version the Apostle Paul used, right? If you don't know, that was a joke. You can laugh. But uh, thank God for the King James Version. But uh, there's, there's some trans, translation errors there. And in this particular verse... John 16, 13, the King James Version says that he, speaking of Holy Spirit, uh, will not speak of himself. 
he will not speak of himself. And so that's what the King James Version says. And it's almost like we, we read that and we think, well, well, Holy Spirit doesn't want us to talk about him or pray to him or sing to him or glorify him. But that's really not a good translation of what that verse says. What it really, uh, a better translation would be this, is that he does not speak on his own. Meaning this, meaning that what the Spirit is going to say is not going to be contrary or apart from what the Father says or what the Son says. It's in harmony and it's in unity. And so, it, it, so just some, some poor teaching, some poor understanding of that Scripture has become a roadblock for some people. And so you need to understand, you can pray to the Holy Spirit. You can sing to the Holy Spirit. You can honor the Holy Spirit. It's a good and it's a right thing for us to do. There's no reason to be afraid or, or worried about it. There's no jealousy. There's no rivalry within the Trinity. The Father is happy with the Holy Spirit, and he's happy that you engage with the Holy Spirit. The Son is happy that you engage with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is the God of the Spirit. The Spirit of God is God the Spirit. So just remember this. Holy Spirit in you is God in you. Everybody say that. Say, Holy Spirit in me, Holy Spirit in me. Is, God in me. is God in me. Now the next truth for us to know is this, is that Holy Spirit is a person. And I realize that this last point that we mentioned and this, this one here, we kind of just barely touched on it a couple of weeks ago, but we didn't give you you know, the scripture for it. And so that's why we're doing this teaching. And so this one right here, the Holy Spirit is person. Uh, if, we, if we look in uh, John 13 through 17, these are the passages that deal with the Last Supper. Jesus is spending these last moments with all of his disciples before Gethsemane. And repeatedly, he mentions Holy Spirit and he uses this word pronoun, this pronoun, he. And so he's referring to Holy Spirit as a person. And as Holy Spirit is a person, he has very definitive ways, just like you have ways. Now, you might think those ways are peculiar. You might think those ways are a little interesting. They're unique, but he has ways. You might not be comfortable with it, but let me just say this. It's the only Holy Spirit you're going to get. So I suggest to you is just kind of get comfortable with his ways because he's probably, he's not going to conform to you. We conform to him, right? The Lord doesn't conform to our image. We conform to the Lord's image. And so, yes, man, this is different. This is interesting. I've never been anything around this before. I've never been around the, the culture of Holy Spirit, the ways of Holy Spirit. That's okay. Get used to it, yeah. right? In, in Hebrews chapter 3, Holy Spirit himself spoke of ancient Israel and how... Ancient Israel did not know God's ways. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. God was grieved with his own covenant people because they didn't know his ways. They should have, but they didn't. So Holy Spirit does have ways that he wants us to know. He wants us to know him and the way he operates. And it's important to know, note this, is that those ways that the Holy Spirit has, they're not contrary and they're not apart from the ways of the Father and the ways of the Son. They're in absolute harmony. They're in absolute unity with the ways of the Father and the Son. The next thing is this. Holy Spirit is eternal. Holy Spirit is eternal. Holy Spirit is equally as eternal as the Father and the Son. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14 says this, How much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal Spirit, the eternal Spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. You know, some people think the Holy Spirit's introduction into the world came like in the New Testament, you know? But Holy Spirit has been, always been present. He's always been around. And you can easily look throughout the Old Testament and you can see reference after reference after reference of the Holy Spirit mentioned time and time and time again. I'll just give you a few of these. Genesis chapter 41, Pharaoh recognizes that Joseph is filled with the Spirit of God. Exodus 31, 3, Bezalel is filled with the Spirit of God. Judges chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, it says the Spirit of the Lord was upon Othniel. 1 Kings 18 and 2 Kings 2 make mention that the Holy Spirit was behind the ministry of Elijah. And this is just 
just a handful of references that keep going, going on and on and on. There's a ton of them. Uh, Holy Spirit had a role in creation. Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. Holy Spirit has always been and will always be. Holy Spirit is eternal. What else do we need to know about the Holy Spirit? We need to know that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. Hebrews 6, uh, uh, yeah, Hebrews 6, 18 says this. It says that it's impossible for God to lie. God cannot lie. So that means the Holy Spirit is incapable of lying to you. He will never deceive you. In uh, John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said of himself, he says that I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? So Jesus saying, I am the truth. Well, skip down 11 verses later, and he's introducing the Holy Spirit to the disciples, and he's talking about Holy Spirit, and he says that Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. So if Jesus is the truth, then so is the Holy Spirit. What does it mean that Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth? Well, it means that Holy Spirit is full of integrity, that Holy Spirit is faithful, the Holy Spirit is trustworthy, that Holy Spirit is genuine. Holy Spirit will never lead you into error. What he reveals to you, you can believe it. You don't ever need to be afraid that the Holy Spirit is going to mislead you or lie to you. The next truth about the Holy Spirit, something I just mentioned just a second ago in passing, is that, that is that the Holy Spirit was involved in creation. The Holy Spirit was involved in creation. We know that Jesus is depicted as creator in John chapter 1, verse 3, where it says, Through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. And then in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, it says, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. These lines here could also very easily describe the person of Holy Spirit as well. For example, he is before all things. So if Holy Spirit is eternal, then it is absolutely makes perfect sense that he was present and involved in, in creation. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, we, we know that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it says in verse 2 that the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So just as Jesus had a hand in creation, Holy Spirit also had a hand in creation. Another thing I just kind of mentioned just a second ago was this, that Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. Holy Spirit, using people, wrote the Holy Scriptures. He was the inspiration to all those who authored the Bible. Uh, Paul wrote this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16. He says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Then Peter wrote this, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. He says, For prophecy never had its origin in the human will of man, but prophets. Men spoke from God as they were carried along by Holy Spirit. Jesus had the exact same view of Scripture that Paul did and Peter did. In the book of Matthew 22, Jesus asks the Pharisees a question that they cannot answer. And this is what he said in verse 43. He says, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? In other words, what's the lineage? The lineage of the Messiah. And they were able to answer this part because they knew because of prophecy. And they said, well, they replied, he is the son of David. And then Jesus responded. He says, then why does David, speaking under the inspiration of the Spirit, call the Messiah my Lord? For David said, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies beneath your feet. And then Jesus said this, Since David called the Messiah my Lord, how can the Messiah be his son? Jesus is saying this, is that, that David was able to write these things in 1000 BC because he was filled with the Holy Spirit, because he was inspired 
by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enabled him to do this. So in, in Acts chapter 4, 25, we see the testimony of the early church. The early church is being persecuted, and they turned to the Lord and said this in verse 25, Acts 4, You spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David. So the Holy Spirit, using people, wrote the Bible. Now I want to say this about the Bible. The canon of Scripture is closed, okay? We can add nothing more to this, and we can take nothing away from it, okay? It, it, it's absolute. It cannot be denied. It cannot be disputed. It's complete in its final revelation. Now, we'll say this. The Holy Spirit, God, still speaks to his people today. But here's the thing. Whatever inspiration it is, whatever revelation it is, it is not greater than this. It is not greater. Whatever the Holy Spirit says to you is not greater than the inspiration is here. I'll tell you again, Siri. <laughs> Whatever Holy Spirit says to you is not greater than what he's saying in here. It can be equal to, it can partner with, it can be in unity with, it can come into alignment with this. But it is not going, listen, listen, it means this, any leading that you get, well, I, I felt led to do this. Any prophetic word that you get, any word of knowledge that you get, or someone speaks over you, any vision, it must be united with the Holy Scripture. If it doesn't, you can reject it. If it's not in alignment with the Bible, you can reject it. 1 Samuel chapter 13, 14 and 15, we see King Saul, and King Saul gets the big head, and he thinks that he's bigger than the Word of God. And he knows the law of Moses, which says that only the priests are the ones, are the ones to offer up the burnt offerings, the sacrifices. But, but, but Saul says to Samuel, Samuel was the man of God. Samuel was the priest and prophet of the day. And he says to Samuel, well, Samuel, I felt compelled. I felt compelled like I was supposed to do this. And you know what? Because he was out of alignment, that was the beginning of the end for Saul. And it says there in those chapters that the Lord rejected Saul because he th Saul thought that he was above the word of God. And so, whenever a person says, well, the Lord told me, that's great. But if it goes against what's in here, then you can safely and absolutely uncomfortably say, well, I don't accept that. I reject that. No matter how credible it might seem, if it's against what's in here, then it's not the Lord. Right. Holy Spirit still speaks to us on various levels, but no level of inspiration is going to be greater than the inspiration of the Bible, period. period yep. Holy Spirit has not, does not, and will not contradict himself. Right. Okay? And since he's the author of the scripture, he has not, does not, and will not contradict what's in here. Yep. He's the one that wrote the Bible. Listen, we could go on and on and on with a dozen more points to talk about the Holy Spirit. Let's wrap it up here today, okay? Without the Holy Spirit, the church would not exist. It wouldn't. Holy Spirit gives us life in Christ. All of our efforts outside of the Holy Spirit are like dust. They're like ashes apart from Him. But partnered with Him, with the Holy Spirit, praise God, this thing here, this stupid magic glove, the Holy Spirit inside of you can do all the things. It can do all the things. Ta-da! Right? But apart from the Holy Spirit, what can we do? What can we accomplish? Yeah. Nothing of kingdom significance. I heard this story once of this um, college student who got this opportunity to interview this old tycoon. And he, this college student asked this old man, he goes, how did you, sir, how did you make your money? How did you make your fortune? 
the old man started in, and he said, well, way back in 1934, in the middle of the Great Depression, I was down to my last nickel. And I went out with that nickel, and I bought the biggest apple I could find. And I spent all day just polishing that apple, making it shiny, making it look good, making it look desirable. And at the end of the day, I sold that apple for 10 cents. And then the next day, I took that 10 cents, and I went and I bought two apples. And I spent all day shining those things up, making them look delicious. And at the end of the day, I sold both of them, and then I had 20 cents. And I kept on with this system for a few weeks. And I ended up with with some money. I ended up with like $40. And I'm going to tell you what, in 1934, $40 was some money. And the college student was mildly impressed. You know, he was impressed at the, you know, at the, the attitude and the, you know, the, the drive of this old guy. But he wanted to like know what's the rest of the story, you know. He says, so what happened next? And the old tycoon says, well, my wife's father died and left us $5 million. <laughs> Okay, that's funnier than that, you guys. <laughs> you know, when Jesus, when Jesus died, when he uh, rose from the grave, when he ascended into heaven, and when the Holy Spirit came and fell on the believers, we became spiritually rich. We didn't do anything to earn it. Maybe we got $40. Well, whoop de doo But when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we are spiritually rich. We're spiritual tycoons. We're spiritual millionaires. We didn't do anything to earn it or deserve it. But the Holy Spirit is inside of you and He's wanting to do a work of sanctification in you and He's wanting to mobilize you to do the work of Jesus in the earth today. What is the work of Jesus in the earth today? Matthew 28, go into all the world, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. You can't do it without the power of the Holy Spirit working in you and through you. Sanctification and mobilization. Yes, Holy Spirit dwells inside of every believer, but also Holy Spirit wants to be upon every believer, just like we see in the book of Acts chapter 2. So yes, salvation belongs to us. And you know what is also the inheritance of every single believer? is Holy Spirit baptism. You know, Holy Spirit baptism. I'm like, well, I don't know. I, just, I don't know about that. I don't know if that's for me. If it's from God, then it's for you. Every spiritual, like God gives good gifts to his children, right? That's what the Bible says. That's what the ultimate inspiration says. And it also says that the Holy Spirit is a gift to us. The person of the Holy Spirit is a gift to us. So if God gives good, good gifts to your children, then you ought to want it. You ought to desire it. You ought to desire to be in relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit, you ought to desire the gifts of the Spirit. You ought to desire to have the fruit of the Spirit be manifesting in your life. Listen, I've said this a number of times, and some of you, this is repeat information, but I'll say it again. But we think the fruit of the Spirit, it's laid out there in, Gal- in Galatians 5, we think the fruit of the Spirit is just some you know, spiritual checklist that we have to go down and we got to make sure that we got to do this, that, well, I got to... I, I got to love, I got to be kind, I got to have meekness and gentleness and all these things, and I got to strive, and that's just what I've got to work to do. That is not what Paul was saying here. Paul was saying, when you get around the person of the Holy Spirit and you've developed a relationship with Him and you know His ways, the automatic fruit of your life looks like this. Yeah. But you've got to spend time with Him. Now, a lot of people, I think a lot of believers, they're spending time with Holy Spirit and they don't even know it. They don't even have language for it. And thank God that God is not limited to our understanding or our language. Amen? Amen. But listen, it is a good thing to desire. It is a good thing to know. It is a good thing to learn. It is a good thing to develop relationship with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand up with me and we'll pray. Y'all are like amazed. It's 11.04. We're like, we're going to beat the Baptist to Golden Corral today. Hey, just a second. We're going to have our prayer team up against this wall. And uh, if there's any need in your life whatsoever that you need prayer for, 
He's like, well, that's too small. It's insignificant. Nothing's too small. Nothing's too insignificant. Well, it's too big. You don't even know. I don't have the faith for it. Guess what? That's why you come down here and pray with somebody else. It might, might have faith for it. There's nothing too big. There's nothing too small. There's nothing too in the middle. We are people of prayer. We believe that God answers prayers. We believe that God moves through our prayers. And so whatever is going on in your life, listen, we have, listen, we're, we're discreet too. We're discreet with the issues that are going on in your life. We're not going around town blabbing everybody's business. Don't miss an opportunity to pray with somebody because, you know, you're afraid. You know, you overcome fear when you step out in faith. You don't overcome fear by just not doing anything. You don't let fear have a grip on your life and keep you from laying hold of all the good things that God has for your life. If you are here today and you came in and you're far from God, you feel that just in your heart, in your spirit, you're like, heart, spirit, I don't know. What does he mean by that? You, you might not even have the, the same language as me, but you just know you feel like, man, I, I feel apart from my creator. I feel apart from God. I'm gonna let you know, you don't have to leave here today feeling the same way. You can leave here knowing that God loves you, that he calls you son, that he calls you daughter, that he has a good plan for your life. And it, it starts with you making the decision to follow Jesus. It starts with you making the decision to declare him in charge of your life and you stop running the show. You know, in the church today, in the American church today, we don't talk a lot about repentance. We think it's a bad word or something. Oh, don't talk about repentance. Don't talk about sin. You know, we just want to talk about the goodness of God. Listen, I want to tell you about what the Bible says about repentance. It says that it's a gift. So you can be happy about repentance. God gives good gifts to his children. And you know what repentance means? It doesn't just mean being sad or sorry. It just means to turn and change your mind. And so you might be going one way, you might be going in one direction, and repentance says, oh, I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to see that this is not God's plan for my life. I'm going to repent, I'm going to change my mind, and now I'm going to embrace God's plan for my life. That's the picture of repentance. And it's not anything you have to be embarrassed or ashamed about. You don't have to, you know roll around the floor and cry even. You can just make the decision. And so today I want to invite you, if that's you today, whether you've followed Jesus before or whether you've never followed him before, I want to invite you, if you need to, embrace the gift of repentance and declare Jesus as the Lord of your life. And so I'm just going to pray right now and invite you to pray with me. And I just also, those of you that desire baptism of the Holy Spirit, that's available to you as well. You receive that the exact same way that you receive salvation. You receive it by faith. You're just like, well, I've prayed for it and haven't received it yet. Well, just keep praying and keep believing, keep receiving. Come down here and pray with somebody on our prayer team. We'll be happy to pray with you about that. But Lord, we come to you today. And God, I'm just trying to put some language here to some people in the room that might be feeling far from you. So Lord, I come to you and I just, um, I see that I've been doing life this way and it's really apart from your way. And I, I don't want to do that anymore. And so I repent. I do what JD said. I turn and I change my mind and I want to point my way in your direction. And, and Jesus, so now I, I, I declare that you be in charge of my life. Be the Lord of my life. I make the decision to believe that God raised you from the dead. And now I give my life to you. And I want you to come, Holy Spirit, come into my life and make me new. Make me that new person. Let the old person die and make me into a new person. Help change my desires, God. Help change my way of thinking, God. Help change some relationships that are in my life that are out of alignment. Bring the right people into my life, God. Give me a desire for the things of your kingdom, for your ways, Holy Spirit. Come and make a difference with my life today the difference that you always intended for me to make. In Jesus' name, amen? amen? Amen. If you just prayed that prayer with me today, I want to invite you at the end when we, when we, everybody disperses and goes out and is the church out in the world, 
come down and see one of my, my friends on the prayer team. We've got a gift that we want to give to you, a book called What's Next. It's our gift to you. And, uh, and for all of the rest of us, you guys, we're not leaving church. The church is just leaving the building. We're going out into the world and Holy Spirit is in you, just like my hand was in this glove, to do things that you couldn't do in your own power. Here's the benediction. May the amazing grace of Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God the Father, and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen? Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.